Uh, I'd like to, uh, to welcome William Douglas to uh, visit with us today. He's kindly come down all the way from Siberia uh, to visit with us today. Um, I don't know if I would have done that even for my fellow Basques, but he's kindly offered to, to come here and give us a, a talk and show us some slides. Uh, Dr. Douglas is a noted author on Basque studies and Basque culture uh, and was the former coordinator of the Basque studies program at the University of Nevada. Uh, he hasn't been down here for, for a while, but he did come several years ago to the Basque Cultural Day, and we very much appreciate him coming back today and sharing some of his thoughts with us. So I'd like you to all give a big hand to uh, Dr. Douglas. Thank you very much. What I want to do today is uh, read you a few prepared remarks. Uh, it will be fairly short. I'll try not to bore you with them. Uh, entitled, In Search of the Bass Sheep Herder. Then I'll show a few slides, and then hopefully we can have a give and take, and maybe uh, try and answer some questions, or at least raise some. So in my talk today, I want to raise a playful, yet ultimately serious question. Is there such a thing as the Bass Sheep Herder? Now we all know that bass herded sheep throughout much of the American West. <coughs> But were they sheep herders? For many observers of the Basque American scene, particularly casual outsiders, the answer seems obvious. Basques were from the Pyrenees, where they were consummate sheep herders, a skill that they then transferred to the American <coughs> West, where they became the region's consummate herders as well. Nevertheless, there are several problems with this explanation. Let me list but three. First of all, while there are professional sheep herders in the Basque Country, men who dedicate their lives, their professional lives, to herding sheep, they are few in number and, in any case, failed to join the ranks of the Basque immigrants. Second, as we shall see shortly, sheep husbandry, the way of raising sheep in the Basque Country, differs considerably from sheep raising practices in the American West. <coughs> Third, while Basques have emigrated to the world's leading sheep producer, Australia, to my knowledge, none has ever herded sheep there. Rather, most Basque immigrants to Australia cut sugarcane in the tropical north, an environment that could scarcely differ more from that of the Pyrenees. This last point underscores a certain reality germane to the immigration experience of all nationalities and not just Basques, that of the perceived employment opportunity in the country of one's destination. In the case of the relatively unskilled and ed uneducated candidates for manual labor, as was characteristic of the majority of rural Basque immigrants, the range of opportunities afforded by receiving countries was rather limited and highly specified. During the 19th century, there was greater flexibility, since the aspirations of millions of potential immigrants among an overpopulated Europe's so-called huddled masses made them disposed to seek opportunity in what the historian de Noon has called Euro-settler societies governed by white ruling elites. Countries such as New Zealand, Australia, South Africa, Argentina, Uruguay, Chile, Canada, and the United States, all embarked upon a policy of national development in which fomenting immigration was the key. In the words of Argentine President Alberti, 19th century, a 19th century figure, and himself of Basque descent, by the way, gobernar es poblar, to govern is to populate. Consequently, all of these countries were in fierce competition with one another to attract European immigrants to their shores, and particularly manual laborers who could tame and settle their internal frontiers. Strategies included sending recruiters to Europe, or employing immigration agents there, subsidizing part or all of the immigrants' transatlantic voyage, 
in creating reception centers and offering various forms of credit to facilitate the rapid adaptation of immigrants in their new homeland. By the 20th century, however, all of the Euro settler societies had matured to the degree that they no longer needed or welcomed unlimited immigration, particularly that of the unskilled. So immigration in the 20th century came to entail the movements of illegal aliens, political and war refugees, and, highly, and the highly skilled in possession of scarce talent or training, and finally, contract labor for highly specific or specified purposes. For our purposes, it is significant to note that since the 1920s, when the United States implemented immigration laws according to national origins quotas, most Spanish-speaking immigrants have entered the country, contracted Spanish Basque immigrants, I should say, have entered the country contracted by sheep ranchers to herd for three years. French Basques were able to enter under the more liberal accommodations of French nationals under the national <coughs> origins quota, but significantly, the majority of them also entered the ranks of the by then well-established Basque sheep herding presence here in the American West. Now before examining the circumstances of the Basque herder, I would say a few words about the history of the activity here. As a historical curiosity, it was the Basque, Juan de Oñate, who in 1598, while colonizing New Mexico, introduced the first sheep into what is today the United States. However, our real historical baseline dates from the California Gold Rush, when Basques from both Europe and southern South America entered the ranks of the gold-seeking Argonauts. Among them were individuals who had been part of the expansion of the sheep industry in the Argentine Pampas during the 1830s and 1840s. When they failed to find gold here in California, a few of these veterans recognized the opportunity to repeat their southern South American experience afforded by the vast open rangeland of Southern California. By the 1860s, several of them were leasing pasture in the more subtle districts, and others had acquired a sheep band and were wandering further afield. As the outfits grew, it became common practice to employ relatives and friends from one's natal village back in the Basque country. After a few years of herding for their patron, these men might in turn establish their own sheep outfit moving further afield in search of new pasture. Now in this fashion, by the end of the 19th century, Basque sheepmen were present in all 13 western states, and the Basque herder was the preferred employee in most Basque and non-Basque owned sheep outfits alike. To say sheep herder was to say Basque, just as to say Basque was for many Americans to say sheep herder. In short, for the better part of a century, say from about 1870 to 1970, it seemed like sheep herding was a, indeed the, Basque profession here in the American West. Parenthetically, I cut my treatment off in, in 1970 because by then our sheep industry, the American sheep industry, was in great decline. And what is the nature of sheep herding? I would argue that while Bass came the closest to converting it into a profession, for everyone, including Bass, whoever engaged in the activity, it was more of a job and a temporary one at that. It was at best a means towards an end. It is in this regard that Basques professionalized the opportunity by employing sheep herding as a way station within their personal, social, and economic mobility. By its very nature, a daily existence characterized by extreme social isolation, herding lends itself to saving money. 
In interviewing many herders and ex-herders, so when I began my research in the early, well, the late 1960s, amongst bass sheep herders here in the American West, as I was interviewing them, I asked them all, inevitably why they came here when sheep, waiting, sheep herding wages by then, by the 1960s and 1970s, here in the United States, were at or below salary levels in Europe. Almost inevitably the answer was along the lines of, here I could save my money. There you have many ways to spend it. In short, they viewed herding as a purgatory to be passed through on the road to a better life. Most came with the intention of going back. While alone on the western ranges, they dreamed of buying a farm, an apartment, or starting a business back home. Many did, while others adapted and gradually defined their dreams in New World ter terms. A not uncommon pattern was for a man to herd for a few years and then go to town to escape the isolation, intending to possibly work for a while longer at a higher paying job in, say, construction in Reno, logging in Burns, Oregon, dairying in Chino, California, or gardening here in San Francisco, before ultimately going back permanently to Europe with considerable savings. Again, some did, while others made the full transition to a new world future, sinking their roots and, more importantly, those of their children in American soil. Indeed, we are present today in one of the most tangible expressions of this transition, a physical building built by Basque Americans as an island of Basque culture in an American sea, a place where they can sense and express their Basqueness, but within the overriding American reality that dominates most of their everyday life. I would now note some of the features of the sheep herders' purgatory. Sheep herding was antithetical to family life. I am aware of only one <laughs> ephemeral instance of a herder accompanied by his wife while on the range herding sheep. So it was, above all, a young bachelor's game. Marriage pretty much meant giving up herding. Although under the contract system, a few married men endured years of separation in order to pay off debt or accumulate savings in order to go back to the Basque country. There is the case of the man who signed four contracts, returning to Europe for about six months between each, impregnating his wife during the stay. While he, when he finally quit herding, he had four children that he barely knew. Sheep herding also challenged severely a man's sanity. The adjustment to extreme solitude was brutal. When first alone on the range, many herders cried themselves to sleep at night. Eventually, all became accustomed to loneliness. But then there was a danger of becoming all too well adjusted. In the press of the sheep, <coughs> in the press regarding the sheep herding, uh, Regarding sheep herding in the sheep herding husbandry districts, there is the occasional reference to the crazy Basco, the crazy Basco sheep herder, who comes to town and who is unable really to interact socially with anyone. He's talking to himself, walk, wandering down the street of the town, and is finally arrested by the authorities and, and possibly turned over to uh, the local hospital. The herders themselves have a vocabulary of madness in which men who became uncommunicative are referred to as being sagebrushed or sheeped. In the Basque country itself, returned sheep herders are regarded to be somewhat socially retarded for having spent too much time alone. As one commentator told me in the village of Echelar, they only have the sheep to talk to. <laughs> Before we look at the slides, I would conclude with a few comments regarding sheep herding imagery among Basque Americans. 
there is a tangible sense in which it provides them with their key ethnic marker. And there are many of you in this room, most of you in this room are Basque Americans. Many of the Basque hotels and restaurants of the American West display as a part of their decor sheep herder as well as old world folkloric motifs. The food is often the wholesome boarding house cuisine served family style at shared tables. Both leg legacies of the days when the seasonally laid off herders were the establishment's main clientele. I think you'll be hearing more about that later this afternoon. Professional bass far removed from herding and sheep husbandry may invoke the legacy by referring to themselves as sheep herders, such as comments like, not too bad for a sheep herder, made by a, an attorney, the grandson of a sheep herder. It's one self it is one form or one expression that one can engage in as kind of mild self-praise. Also, the image of the herder has itself evolved from the villainous during the days of the cattlemen versus sheepmen confrontations that are both depicted and distorted in Western film and literature into that of the noble sentinel guarding his flock against the backdrop of Western sunsets, at peace with himself in, the, in his bucolic setting, far from the hustle and bustle of the city's madding crowds. As Americans increasingly extol nature and simplicity, the herder looms as an idyllic figure within our imaginations. Like so many other mythic exercises, the romantic dreaming bears little resemblance to the mundane reality. For the bass who, by their very lives, created the stereotype of the bass sheep herder here in the American West, they have passed their own judgment on its worth. They gave it up. Today's sheep herders are Mexicans, Peruvians, and Chileans. I doubt that today there are a dozen Basques herding sheep throughout the entire American West. I would be surprised if there are more than a dozen. The era of the Basque sheep herder is over. We now acknowledge it in the remembrance by erecting the bronze sculpture of Reno's National Monument to the Bass Sheep Herder, or organizing museum exhibits, such as the recent one at the High Desert Museum in Bend, Oregon, and holding sessions like this one today, here in urban San Francisco, far removed in both time and space from our subject's reality. Okay? Now, let me show you some uh, slides the point of which, basically, in the Basque country, there are really sort of two sheep raising syndromes. One, which I was going to show you initially, it happens primarily in the higher Pyrenees, largely in the French Basque area, is one of highly professionalized herding. There are a few people who mm -hmm. are year-round herders, but for the most part, the farmsteads down in the lower country will pool their farm flocks together and then send herders up to the high country, up to the, uh, considerably above tree line, with everybody's combined flock, maybe 30 sheep per household, and they'll spend the summer in, in the high country. Why don't you go ahead and change them? We'll see. A, well, they, here are a couple of herders on their way up to, uh, uh, to spend the summer in the high country. Next slide. Hard to see, but uh, here you have a, a mule uh, loaded with supplies, and now they've reached the high summer range. And here you see a fairly major flock of sheep, but this flock of sheep is being raised in a high mountain pasture, and these sheep would probably belong to eight or ten different households. They would not belong to a single herder. They would be pooled for the purposes of the summer. The herders live in these stone chabolak or, or uh, huts, and they bring the sheep in tightly every day, and they milk them and make cheeses. Uh, that's one of the main sources of income from the sheep. So the sheep are 
are closely herded. They're brought in uh, on a daily basis, milked, the cheeses are made, the cheeses provide a source of income. I would also add that here in the Pyrenees, uh, at this point, there are really no danger of predators. There are no bears, there are no wolves, all of that's gone. So in effect, you're not protecting the sheep at all from anything, okay, in the Pyrenees. Very different from the, United, from the West. The other aspect of this are Baserriac or farmsteads that never send their uh, animals to the high country might have 20 or 30 sheep that are raised under fence, as in this case. Uh, next slide, please. Or here's a gentleman with his farm flock. The, the 20 or 30 animals will oftentimes just be allowed to graze freely on the uh, nearby village commons, uh, lands that come right down to the, and border the uh, private lands of the, of the little farm. And they're just allowed to go up and wander around on their own for a week at a time, two weeks at a time. Then somebody from the household will be sent up to just check up on them. Okay? But again, there's no fear that anything's going to happen to them. There's also a difference in terms of the breed. These are churros. Or it's a, it's a, a kind of sheep that is not raised here in the American West. Okay, it is not a particularly good meat-producing sheep at all. It has very long wool, however, and it, and it produces good milk. Here in the American West, we have various varieties and cross varieties, but essentially it's the merino uh, as, as the stock. And the idea really that the main cash crop here is producing uh, lamb and mutton and, and of course, some wool. Okay? And nobody in the American West, to my knowledge, ever milks sheep for the, and, and makes cheeses. These are kaikwak, or the traditional um, wooden bowls that would be carved out of a solid piece of wood that were used for milking sheep. You would stick them under the, animal, uh, under the ewes and, and milk them. And here's a dear friend of mine on, uh, from Echelad, Bereko Subi. He is shearing his uh, 25 sheep, does it by himself. Nobody comes in and does it for him. He just brings them in, shears them. Uh, go ahead, next slide. And here he is on his way to town with his entire year's wool crop. Two, ba two bags of, of wool. He's all dressed up. Uh, he's uh, planning to have quite a day. He'll come back about 4 o'clock in the morning, get in trouble with his wife. Uh, but this is, you know, he's, this is a great festive moment for him. So he's basically, he views that wool as his, and he's going to town, and he's selling it, and he's going to have some fun. Okay, uh, and town means a chalar, which with, with his two little taverns, and uh, so he's going to spend some time at the bar uh, buying drinks for his friends. Okay, keep going forward because I left a, a blank. Now these are scenes from the American West. Now note the difference in this landscape. Here's a herder with his dog, uh, contemplating. I mean, it's too bad that the contrast is not very good, but this vast desolation. This vast country without a single tree. Okay. Uh, this is out in Elko County, huge mountains, uh, again, vast country, and strung out all along the back here is, is this herder, particular herder's band uh, of probably a thousand ewes and their lambs. Is that near the rubies? Right near the rubies, yeah. Okay, this is a herder warming himself by a sagebrush fire, uh, probably in the late fall when it's cold. Go ahead. Great deal of solitude. I, I can't, oh, here's the band here against this vast panorama. I mean, it is, the, the scale of what's going on here is so completely different from anything in the Basque country. And of course, having had a few farm animals, just essentially handled the way that we've already discussed, doesn't prepare anyone to, for, for this kind of an experience. Basically, the herders who came here, the bass who came here to herd sheep, learned how to do it here in the American West. They learned it from the veteran herders. In fact, during the contract period, in order to come here, many, many of the herders who came here had, weren't even from rural backgrounds. Uh, there used to be a bar in Guernica where you could go and uh, talk to the bartender and he would tell you what they were going to ask you at the American consulate in Bilbao. How many teeth does a sheep have and whatnot. 
and you'd go there and basically you'd tear up your identity card that said that you were a factory worker and you'd go to the Spanish police and you'd say, well, I lost my card, fill out a new card, well, what are you? Well, I'm a farmer. And then you would go to the bar, you'd learn how many teeth a sheep had, then you'd go to the American <coughs> consulate, you'd uh, then get on a plane and you'd come to the American West and then you'd, they would take you out on the range and a veteran herder would take you under his wing, and that's where you would learn how to herd sheep, and particularly sheep under American conditions. Okay, go ahead. This is lambing in southern Idaho, where it's, it's a lot colder than it is, and uh, certainly in California and in parts of Nevada, so they have actual lambing sheds. But again, we can't see very well here. Here's a herder assisting a lamb that's involved, I mean, a, a ewe that's having some problems with a breech birth. Here's an orphan lamb uh, in a saddlebag kind of affair on a horse. In contrast to my friend Berekosubi or Bekosugi, uh, in the <coughs> American West, the shearing of sheep is done by crews, usually uh, Mexican crews that travel from ranch to ranch. And so you bring your thousand, you, know, you bring your bands in, uh, one band at a time, and 10 or 12 or 14 guys who travel <coughs> around in an old school bus and, and set up their own camp and whatnot and just set up this kind of assembly line to shear the sheep for you. The herders never shear the sheep here in the American West. So here, from one particular uh, shearing on an eastern Nevada uh, outfit, here he, this fellow is rolling the last bag of wool up onto this quite large flatbed truck. So if we contrast Bekusugi's two bags of wool with what uh, just came <laughs> off, of, off of this particular outfit, we can see the difference in scale in terms of... Well, these are just some... This is a docking scene. Uh, the lambs are then docked. Does everyone know what docking means? Castrated? Okay. By, by pulling the, the testicles of the young males out by, with their teeth. Now this is a band of sheep being taken to the high country in, in uh, Idaho, southern Idaho, up towards the uh, Sun Valley. And here is a typical band of sheep on the summer range here in the western United States. And you can see the size of that. And you can contrast that in your mind to the, to the band with the large flock of sheep that we saw in the Pyrenees that, that belonged to ten different owners. This is, of course, just one band of about five of one southern uh, Idaho sheep rancher. Very, very lonely existence. Uh, the herders live in teepee tents, move around. Um, I think this is a from Playboy magazine. I just see it very well, but, uh, That's probably a picture of his mother. For obvious, oh, yeah. it's definitely not a picture of his mother. <laughs> from, from, but for obvious reasons, uh, uh, he's done that. But he, most of the week, this this man is by himself until his camp tender comes to resupply him, bringing in supplies on a uh, mule. And uh, so he'll spend four, three, four, five days by himself, uh, well, with his dog. And <clears throat> that will, and then he'll gradually, they'll move the camp as they use up different parts of the uh, grazing available in this particular outfit. But uh, uh, his contacts, his human contacts, are absolutely minimized. Which, by the way, had an incredible impact, as you might imagine, upon the herder's ability while herding to assimilate uh, into American culture. I mean, they were not exposed to English, they were not exposed to American life at all. And unlike the Pyrenean situation, uh, here indeed it is critical to protect the band of sheep from mountain lions in this case, the coyote, uh, bears is part of the range. Here's a herder uh, just in front of his tent, wa washing his dishes. To combat boredom, or just a, a, as a pastime, the herders would often make these stone cairns. These are all stones stacked one on another, and in bass are called arimutiliak, or bat stone boys. So it's a kind of a way of, of humanizing the, the natural environment and also passing time. And out through some of the sheep grazing districts, in the, particularly in the Great Basin, 
on uh, a lot of hillsides, you'll see these cairns made by herders. And I'm sure uh, Jose Maillet will be talking more about this uh, later, but of course, carving on tree trunks, uh, the famous Basque aspen carvings, the ar arboroglyphs, as they're called technically, uh, was another way of passing time and leaving one's mark on the environment and creating a kind of tradition amongst her herders, communicating with past and future herders. This particular one is the tree of Guernica. So some of these statements are political, a lot of them are pornographic, uh, a lot of them are more in the nature of Kilroy was here, just a, somebody's name, the date, whatever. But uh, this one happened to be the tree of Guernica, the oak tree and whatnot from Guernica underneath it. This is a camp tender making uh, with a Dutch oven, uh, preparing uh, bread for his herders. I don't know if that one didn't go. Don't worry about it. Try it again. It's not important. Let's go to the next one if it will. Yeah. Okay, then <clears throat> I suspect that the last one was a shipping scene, uh, shipping corrals. In the fall, they bring the, the, um, the bands down, they separate the lambs, that year's lambs from the ewes. They, ship the lambs, uh, that's a big moment for the sheep rancher because it's his major source of income for the year. And then the herder is trekking south into the desert where the sheep are kept during the desert. This is in eastern Nevada. This particular <coughs> outfit treks about 200 miles on foot, uh, any, about 8 to 10 miles a day. And you can see the sheep wagon here. I guess you have one out in front, which looks different than this one, but this is a very common uh, sheep wagon. One out in front strikes me as older, more of an antique one. Yeah. It looks like a great wagon. I, I look forward it's to like that. It's a yes? sheep condominium. Uh, what did the sheep or the sheep? <laughs> well, <laughs> no, no. The, well, the sheep herders. Pardon me? What did the sheep herders eat? Yeah, the sheep herders are, the herders are always allowed to, to take some lamb, uh, to, you know, to, to butcher the occasional lamb for their meat supply. And then they're supplied with staples like, you know, rice, beans, pasta, that kind of thing. Uh, some outfits will provide them with wine, um, bread, uh, eggs, uh, canned goods. But it, it, it's a pretty simple affair. Yeah, but they ate their friends. <laughs> well, that makes sense. <laughs> I like it. Yeah. Well, uh, in the picture you like it. Yeah. Kind of the nature of uh, yeah, ranching generally. Uh, Go ahead. Okay, these are a couple of herd, or a herder on the winter range, living in his his uh, sheep wagon. You see his his charges there in the background. His dog. In the winter, there they uh, oftentimes uh, there will be two herders brought together, uh, working. They'll combine the bands of two herders, which uh, means that sometimes they'll retain them. But oftentimes, particularly in the old days, they would lay off. Under the contract system, they couldn't lay the herders off. But before the contract system was in effect, uh, the herders basically had a job for sure for about seven months out of the year. And then about half of the workforce would be laid off after the lambs were shipped because they would take the ewes uh, and combine two bands of ewes together for, for herding in the winter. And one of the herders would be sent to town. And that, in a way, and that, in effect, is the genesis of the Basque Hotel here in the American West. They were boarding houses, and the, the, their main function, really, was to provide the herders who were laid off seasonally with a place to pass the winter. So, uh, anyway. But later, with the contract system, you had to pay the herders, uh, you know, it was a contract, a 12-month contract, so it wasn't as easy to do. This fellow's actually inside of his, uh, here he's got a wood stove, and uh, they're actually quite comfortable, although I remember when we were first, uh, when I was first doing my research with Bass Kroners here in the American West in the late 60s, uh, the U.S. government had created OSHA, and OSHA went out into the desert and decided that these wagons didn't meet OSHA standards because they didn't have two exits. So... <laughs> So for about three or four years, there was this big sort of uh, 
conflict between the sheep ranchers and the herders and on the one hand and the federal government on the other. There were a few fines and whatnot for that. And of course, even in the desert, it can snow in the winter. But the idea basically is to get the sheep down to low enough country where they're uh, grazing on this white sage, which is fairly nutritious and, and gets, the, uh, gets them through. And for the most part, you want to be below the snow line. You want to be out of snow. And, it, and in many cases, you're bringing water to the sheep. You're trucking water to the sheep. Or there may be a couple of water holes on your winter range and, that you use. But you, you're pretty much trying to stay out of this kind of weather. Is that it? I think that's it. Okay, that's probably it. So anyway, that's, uh, maybe you can give us a little, hopefully I've thrown out a lot of uh, provocative, made a lot of provocative off the wall statements. So uh, why don't we? But to, to be cheaper in Europe and cheaper here is very different. Very different. Uh, the observation here, I'm sure that most of you in the back couldn't hear was that to be a sheep herder in Europe and to be a sheep herder here was very different. Uh, you know, that <coughs> was, was exactly what I was trying to, to get across with this. There's just no question. It, you know, it, it, it almost doesn't even make sense to apply the same word sheep herder to the two phenomena. The other point that I would make, by the way, about that is how... I think one of the lessons in, in all that we've just looked at and discussed today is the following. It's real easy for us to fall into the simplistic trap of thinking that when people come to this country, uh, they bring a skill and they look for a way to use it in this country. In other words, there's a match between bass because they herded sheep in the Pyrenees and bass here in the American West. Or you, know, you can take any ethnic group, and there's a stereotype of, of, of that particular ethnic group, and we have this tendency to want to see this one-to-one -one transfer. The fact of the matter is that bass went all over the world. Uh, bass immigrated to every inhabited continent on the planet. And they basically got engaged in different activities in each of those destinations. And the activity that they got involved in had very, very little to do with any kind of skill or background that they brought from the Pyrenees, and everything to do with the opportunities and the circumstances and the situations in the countries at that particular moment that they were going to. So, you know, one of my studies, which I haven't finished, I'm working on it right now, I'm writing a book on bass in the antipodes, involves the bass uh, sugar cane cutters in North Queensland, in Australia. And I spent a year with them and then going all over Australia and tracing ex cane cutters and where they have resettled in Australia. And as I mentioned earlier, I do not know of a, of a single example of a Basque ever getting involved in the sheep business in Australia. And that is the major sheep producing country in the world. So, you know, we need to be careful of drawing those sort of simplistic one to one correlations. But, I mean, in Australia, at least from what I understand, they have a giant ranch with the 10,000 sheep in all of kind of one place where they don't, they don't really trail them from one place to another as much do they Well, that's true, but that was also true in the Argentine Pampas, and yet Bass in the 1830s and 1840s saw that as a big opportunity and were very involved in that. So they didn't go to high country, low country like we do here in the American West, or like they do in the Pyrenees. You know, transhumans, which is the expression for trailing to the high country summer pasture and down to low country winter passage is, is characteristic here and in, the, in, and, in, um, and in the Pyrenees. But in southern South America, bass were raising sheep down there under conditions quite similar to those in Australia. Now, you're right about one thing. The development of the Australian sheep industry has its own peculiar history that is very, very different from what happened in southern South America and here in the American West. And that was a, a situation. Also, southern Europeans were all but uh, prohibited from entering Australia until the 20th century. Uh, Australians were very, very loath to allow anybody who was not either British or northern <coughs> European into Australia. They had indeed what they called the white Australia policy. 
And uh, they basically were, it was an almost hermetically sealed country until the 20th century. So when Bass were getting involved in an expanding frontier in both southern South America and here in the American West and in North America, Australia was an expanding frontier as well, but it was, it was uh, off limits, really, to southern Europeans. I was born and raised in Susanville as sheep. Okay. And in sheep, we didn't have these luxury units as you have in these trailers up in Susanville. I mean, we were uh, by borough. We were Astuaki. <laughs> and uh, well, uh, Carniche here, Batita, he was our herder back in the early 50s. While I was going to school, he figured he was putting me through school. We're the same age. <laughs> I love the sheep. And I wanted to stay in the business. He wanted out. And he's been a success in his gardening here on the peninsula, and I got bumped out. But uh, nobody runs sheep in Lassen County anymore. No, they don't. But let me also ask you a question. You wanted to stay in the sheep, but did you want to herd them? Or did you want to own them? Well, I, I, I heard them. <laughs> 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 I mean, there is a difference. I know. I know. Well, we have nothing. I, I realized when I, I was around a sheep for a couple of years, and uh, I lost a herd of one summer, and I had to herd out there uh, in uh, Butt Lake, which was a uh, real tough terrain. And I was out there with the borough for uh, uh, the, those months. But I appreciated another thing, that we didn't have anything to offer the young Basques. Nothing in the way of a future, and with the environmentalists, and with what the government was doing to us, BLM and so on. Sure. It was a dying industry, and today nobody runs sheep in Lassen County. Where there was 40,000 head of sheep, there Espiel is the only guy who comes down from Alturas, and nobody else runs sheep there. Right. But that's kind of what's happened everywhere. Elko County sure. had 100,000 sheep when I was in high school, and maybe there's 5,000 sheep now. Right. I, I mean, when I said that, for instance, that bass are no longer herding sheep, and that Chileans, Mexicans, and Peruvians have taken their place. They've taken their place, but on a much more limited scale. Uh, there are far fewer sheep herders in the Amer entire American West today, probably not a third as many as there were 25 years ago even, let alone uh, around the turn of the century. I mean, around the turn of the century, we had the opposite problem here in the American West. There were really too many sheep. Nevada, by various estimates, had between a million and two million sheep, Nevada alone. So the, there were huge issues of overgrazing. There was all kinds of competition. Uh, I think Diamond Mountain out around Eureka, at one point there was something like uh, nearly 20 bass sheep bands on one mountain that was not all that big or great of a mountain. And it was pretty marginal grazing. And you know there were all, there were all kinds of stories that came out of there of, of uh, bass herders trying to trick each other to get to the water hole first and all, you know, all sorts of things because the competition was absolutely brutal. So it's an entirely different situation today, no question. But another thing that I think is fair to say is that sheep herding, per se, was never a great, it was never a profession. I mean, that's how I started. Nobody ever, you know, nobody's high school counselor ever <laughs> suggested that he go be a sheep herder, okay? Uh, or a fishing guide, or, uh, you know, I mean, there, there's certain kinds of things that people do or, and did as a kind of an expediency, as a way station, as a temporary way to get through things. Sometimes, uh, I mean, there's a literature, uh, 19th century literature, about sheep herding here in the American West, which, by the way, in, in that literature, the sheep herder is just about the worst possible form of life. Not the sheep rancher, I mean, there was that too, cowboy versus sheepman. But the herder himself was viewed as, you know, probably a drunk, probably, uh, you know, a life's loser one way or another. And so people were blowing through that profession here in the American West until the Bass came in and, as an ethnic group, embraced it as an opportunity. Nobody had sort of collectively embraced it as an opportunity. I shouldn't say nobody, because the Navajo did, and uh, there, there's a little pocket in southern Oregon and extreme northeastern California where the Irish did up around uh, Lake County and up uh, the uh, Stern Mountain in that area there was actually for a while a kind of syndrome in parts of Montana the Scots were herding sheep uh, on kind of a regular basis and there was it was institutionalized and people were being brought in but bass and, and of course the Mormons in Utah uh, Mormon families were raising sheep and you know that that, that was kind of their own 
hermetically sealed world too. But for the most part, in the Hispano, uh, Hispanos in, in New Mexico, but the, the kind of stereotypical sheepmen that emerged was the Basque sheep. And in part it was because, you know, Basque began to come here and <clears throat> they were ill prepared in a lot of ways to adapt quickly to America. I mean, there was a language barrier to begin with. That English was not spoken in the Basque country, so it was already a language thing. Plus, those early <coughs> pioneers in, here in California that established a, a kind of a, a beachhead here in the United States kept set, started sending back, and first thing you knew, you had chain migration. So little by little, through the second half of the 19th century, Basques, more than any other ethnic group, sort of built this kind of system, uh, this bridge from Europe to, to the American West, across which many young men passed. And most of them went back. Very, very few ever came intending to stay in the United States. It was viewed as a temporary labor situation. Same thing amongst Basques in Australia. A, a few went down there to cut sugar cane three or four years to save a lot of money, because you could make quite a bit of money doing it, and go home. Uh, so it was viewed that in those terms. It wasn't viewed as, as something that, you know, nobody came here. I, I, would, I would question whether a single Basque ever came here at age 18 or 19 thinking he was going to retire at age 70 as a sheep herder here in the American, in the American West. Do you have any idea what percentage stayed? I mean, one of the things we found in the movie we put is almost, in, in my experience also, is no one ever came with a plan to stay. Everyone came over here to make some money, go home, get married, buy a little farm, buy a bar. But Amongst you know, stayed, you know, what percentage ended up staying here? No one knows, and the reason we can't know is because of the way this country counted Basques. We never counted them as Basques until 1980. We always counted them as Spanish or French nationals, which scrambled Basque statistics uh, to the point where it's virtually impossible. And so all we can do is kind of make guesses. I mean, you can go to a place like Boise, Idaho, and sort it out pretty well with local records. But you can't even begin to sort it out in Los Angeles, for instance, uh, for a lot of different reasons. But, and in Boise, Idaho, just by following the, the tracks of Basque surnames, you can go a long way. But you go to Los Angeles and look up Aguirre in the telephone book, and there's you know 25 pages of Aguirre's, probably four of whom are Basque. So it's a very, very difficult challenge to do that down there. So the answer is nobody really knows. Um, my guess is, I mean, if I were going to have to make a guess, I doubt if one in ten who came stayed. There were almost as many bass where we do have some records of entries and departures. And there are, there are a few kind of fragmentary records of that. It seemed to be about a push. Almost as many people were going back as were coming in in a particular year. So I don't think very few, very many were sort of, you know, kind of falling off the uh, wagon of the system and staying here. Now, of course, obviously some did. Most of the people in this room, one way or another, are here today because some did. Uh, but um, it was, in terms of the total magnitude of the movement, it uh, was a very, very small fraction at any one point in time. Did you find that to be more true of Bass than, say, the, the great Irish immigration where they, they came over with a plan to stay? Yes, absolutely. In fact, I would say that, that Basque immigration to the United States was probably an extreme case of, of intended seasonal or you know, temporary migration, sojourner type migration. Very, very few Basques came over in family units to the United States. Now, that doesn't mean that Basques were not immigrating as family units with the intention of staying. They were going to South America. They were going to Argentina. The largest concentration of Basques possibly in the world is in Argentina today, maybe even larger than the Basque country itself, depending upon how you want to count. But there are at least hundreds of thousands of Basques in Argentina and their descendants, and there have been estimates as high as four million. So, you know, and they were going there as family units in many cases. They were going as single men as well, but very, very few family units came here. Now, there were people who came here, herded sheep, became a little bit comfortable with this, decided they wanted to stay a bit longer, 
and sent back for a wife, went back for a wife, that kind of thing. Plus the hotels were bringing in uh, young women to work in the hotels and as domestics and stuff. And, and many of them married herders that were uh, here already. And so then you began to have the basis for the Basque American family and they began to sink roots. And uh, so that's really the genesis of the Basque American community. And today, I mean, as of the last census, uh, it would seem that there are right around 50,000 uh, Americans who uh, claimed at least part Basque ancestry in the last census. 50,000, yeah. Now, I was a census taker. Yeah. And I found a lot of it leaned toward Mexican American. Mm -hmm. And there was nothing mentioned in all of the things they had there about the Basque people. I found two people out of the three, four months that I was there who were of past descent, French, Spanish. But couldn't you under, 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 I thought that the category, in fact, allowed, uh, allowed you to identify yourself as well, yeah. Basque, French so Basque, or Spanish Basque. That. But it was like, uh, it was amazing to me that we're still a mystery. Nobody oh, sure. knows where we came from, and nobody knows we're here. Right. <laughs> I, actually, I, I can tell you a little story about that census. Um, we uh, were called on in 1978 at the University of Nevada, Reno, at the Bass Studies Program. Got a call from the Census Bureau. Uh, and they were not going to census bass at all. And uh, they were just going <laughs> to lump them under. Uh, as, you, as you may know, Adding any category within the U.S. Census is a huge decision because it creates, uh, it's very expensive to, you know, you know, to compile and whatnot. So they didn't want, you know, the, the, the uh, question that was put to me basically was, does it make sense to census bass? I mean, bass do not have a, fl a flag, I mean, they don't have a country, they don't have a seat at the United Nations. Should we even ask the question? Or are we just really talking about sort of variations of Frenchmen and Spaniards? And I argued uh, strongly at the time that not only should they census bass, but they should make a distinction between French bass and Spanish bass. And we argued that so strongly, they made me give them a list of names of, of bass people around the American West to call to, con to, to kind of confirm what I was saying at the time. And they made the decision to do that. And it was a huge decision because if you look at Italian, for instance, in the U.S. Census, they don't break out Sicilians and Piemontese and whatnot. And there are a lot more Sicilians and Piemontese and whatnot in the United States by a huge factor than there are Basque. But we were able to establish that. And so the last two censuses have allowed us to get a good handle on at least a, a reasonable handle on the magnitude of the Basque population in the United States and how it's distributed. One of the interesting things, by the way, for, for all of your uh, uh, consideration, in the 1980 census, uh, people were identifying themselves as, the most were either opting for Spanish Basque or, or French Basque. Very few were saying Basque. In 1990, of those people opting for Basque, the majority opted for Basque. And I think that may be a function of NABO and the fact that you've all you know, you're getting together more, there's more of this shared sense of, because earlier on, Bass and Boise really didn't consider themselves as having very much to do with Bass and Bakersfield. But, you know, and it was this whole kind of old world sense of division was very palpable here in the American West amongst the Basque American community, and there were really two very distinct colonies of Biscayans on the one hand and, and French and Navarrese on the other. That seems to be breaking down. Uh, at least in terms of the results of the census, where people are now identifying more as generic bass than saying, no, I'm French Basque. Yeah, I, I found the same thing. It's just that we're a mystery even to ourselves. Yeah, we well. We don't know where he came from. <laughs> That's right. Aliens from another planet. Right? <laughs> well. I like that. <laughs> well, that's interesting. Yeah. Well, I have a question about uh, the chain migration. I know, like, in the Boise area, people are from East Bastet and Ibarangelua, a really small little mm -hmm. part of Biscaya. And here, the people are predominantly from Iparalde. So were those, like, two separate chains? And I Very know also so. that, you know, I read that most of the immigration to the Boise area was between 1890 and 1924 when those, that immigration mm -hmm. law was enacted. And it seems like in this area, maybe people came a little later. I don't know if they no, were. No, much earlier. Much earlier. 
French tequila? Yeah, Cali the French Bass California and, uh, uh, baseline was established during the gold rush. Okay. Most of the people that were, Army yeah, yeah, people like Busta and Shuri and whatnot in Southern California. And then it continued like, uh, later, it seems like. Yeah, actually. There's more first generation people here well, that's, that, that, that's another good point, Lisa, because what tends to happen when you look at, you know, a, 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 uh, the history of a movement that's now 150 years old in terms of the way we've been talking about it today, since the California gold rush to the new millennium, over that you're going to have ups and downs, you're going to have peaks and valleys. The reason why there are so many, you know, old world born French bass today in San Francisco versus old world born Spanish bass in Boise it has to do with that national origins thing that made it much harder for somebody with a Spanish passport to come into the United States and take out permanent residency. The French quota was not even being filled some years, the French national quota. So anybody from Iparaldi, even though it was a tiny little part of the Basque country, old world Basque country, could pretty much come. Uh, if you wanted to come under the quota system, uh, and you were from Bilbao, uh, good luck. I mean, you might wait seven or eight or ten years. That's why a lot of people, a lot of urban bass who wanted to come here, came on sheep herding contracts as opposed to sitting around waiting for seven or eight years until their number came up. Because there were only like 124, I think, Spanish nationals a year that were being allowed in at the time versus uh, 20,000 French nationals or whatever. And, so was and that just a racist situation? Or? It was. It, in, in part it was, but it was a, a racist situation once removed. Uh, when they set up the national origin system, what they did was they determined how many people from what various countries around the world had already come to the United States, and that prov provided the formula. So, and, but there was a southern, anti-southern European bias in the, late, in the late 19th century and early 20th century in this country. So they, they were, you know, there was a certain resistance to, to uh, Southern and Central Europeans coming to the United States. They, they, there was a preference given to sort of Northwestern Europe uh, in, our, in our whole policy of, you know, uh, of handling that issue. So, of course, in 1921, when they, I think it was when they first discussed, uh, counted, and then in 1924 when they locked it in place, I mean, uh, if you were Irish, uh, there were, in the last census, 50 million Americans self-identified as part Irish. 50 million. And there's like about 6 million people in Ireland, you know? So, uh, so it was never an issue for the Irish, uh, for a lot of his bad historical reasons and a very rough experience in, in a lot of respects. There were a lot of Irish here, so you set up the national origins quota for Irish, and uh, any, anybody in Ireland that wanted to come here was in pretty good shape. There had been very, very few Spanish nationals who had come prior to 19, the 1920s to the United States in any capacity whatsoever. For one thing, Spanish nationals uh, had a <coughs> propensity to go to Latin America. They were the mother country of all of Latin America, the Philippines. They even, they even had colonies in, the, I mean, the Philippines and Cuba were their colonies until the end of the 19th century, until the Spanish-American War. So there just wasn't much incentive for Spaniards to come, and they would have had, and they would have met a certain resistance anyway coming in. So then, when they counted up how many Spanish nationals had entered, they just did the math and they said, okay, 121 or 124 can come in every year. So that was that. The French had a much broader, longer tradition of coming to the United States in, in larger numbers. Pardon me? And, and stay, right, right. So the French quota was set at a you know, much higher number. And it was really good because, I mean, it was good for an, an intending immigrant because during the 20th century, the French economy has basically been a lot stronger than the Spanish economy. So there hasn't been a huge interest amongst French nationals to immigrate, generally, you know, across the whole country. France has not been a, a nation of immigrants during the 20th century. Any other questions? Well, thank you very much. Okay. We really appreciate the coming.